So welcome to our Regional Emergency Operations Center, or EOC. And this is where public safety officials from throughout the region come during times of disaster to provide overarching guidance and provide resources during times of emergency. This particular EOC is governed by an interlocal agreement between two cities and the county. It's based on a flood disaster that occurred in 1997. And so we have an interlocal operating agreement that places us on the high ground above the city of Reno. You'll notice if you attend other emergency operations centers that you can tell which disasters cause them to be built. For example, in Washington State, in Seattle, the Emergency Operations Center is built on rollers and springs, so as the earth moves, the EOC can survive that. We're on a hill because we're flood-based. Often you'll see emergency operations centers that were funded by Homeland Security money, and they have different protections for man-made threats. So we're in the lobby right now of the Emergency Operations Center. This is where our uh, staff and visitors would enter. If you were a media person here to report on the emergency, we would invite you into our media briefing room. And let's go there right now. So this is the media briefing room, and it's where public safety officials interact with uh, not only the media, but our citizens. You can tell the regional nature of our center by looking up on the soffit, and you'll see the county and the two cities, our two tribal partners, and the two districts, the school district and the health district. Along the back soffit, you'll also see a variety of agencies that work here as well. We meet every other month with all of our regional partners in a thing that we call the Local Emergency Planning Committee, or LEPSI, to review emergency plans and make sure that people are familiar with the facility so that in times of disaster, we can quickly come and provide services to the region. Here in this room, we most often present uh, briefings to the media, but we can also uh, provide educational uh, information, things like uh, boil water orders and, and uh, things that normally the media might not interrupt television to, uh, to relay to the public, but we can pre-record them and show them at a later basis. Okay, so the media does not always have free access to the emergency operations center. There could be things of, uh, of importance or confidentiality. Uh, we could be debating whether to instill a curfew, for example. And until those decisions are made, we wouldn't want to, uh, to release those to the public. So this is a secure room and only the staff that has a role in the Emergency Operations Center are allowed into the coordination room. And that will be our next stop on this tour. All right, so from the media briefing room, we move into the main coordination center. Now, again, only the public safety officials that are vetted to be part of the uh, Emergency Operations Center come into the main room and that's why we have a security desk and a sign in, check badges, make sure that the appropriate people are entering the EOC. As we move forward, you'll also see that we have a joint information center, and here's where the public information officers meet, interface with the media, and then can come around to do the media uh, briefings as well. Okay, let's enter the main coordination room. So welcome to our main coordination room for our emergency operations center. This emergency operations center is organized in the incident command system. So it's organized by sections. Some emergency operations centers you'll see are um, organized by emergency support functions. We don't feel that we're big enough to do that. We don't have enough staffing. 
And an advantage of uh, organizing in the incident command system is it's easier to coordinate with incident commanders in the field because you have like position names. This is our operations section. It begins at this end of the table generally with infrastructure, public works, animal services, utilities, the energy company. In the center of the table, you get more into fire, law enforcement, emergency medical services. We even have representatives from the Associated General Contractors, private sector that owns bulldozers, the school district, of course, our hazardous materials team. And at this end of the table, we're into medical, hospital representatives, and health, all essential. And the operations center is in direct coordination with operations in the field. Now, the plan that the operations center is using is developed by the planning section. The planning section is determining what are our objectives for the next operational period. Now, of course, these objectives are all vetted and approved by our management section, but the planning section is developing an incident action plan for the next operational period. And even as the incident is ongoing, they're cons considering things like, how are we going to demobilize at the end of the incident? Of course, they're ensuring that the Emergency Operations Center has proper documentation and uh, coordinating missions and tasks. At the end of an operational period, the planning section hands the new plan to the new operations section at shift brief, the shift change, the op section begins executing that plan and planning starts working on what are we going to do tomorrow. And this cycle continues until demobilization and the incident is resolved. Now, you cannot run an emergency operations center or a disaster without addressing the financial end of the operation. We rely on the finance section not only to help approve expenditures during the operation, but they're tracking costs so that at the uh, end of the incident, we can bill the state and federal government, uh, State Division of Emergency Management or FEMA, and to seek some reimbursement for costs. We may not be approved for reimbursement, but at least we have tracked all the costs of the incident, how much time was spent, uh, the claims against the uh, jurisdiction, and again, how much it costs. That's our finance section. The logistics section is involved with getting materiel, supplies, and services. It's divided into a service branch and a support branch. Everything from uh, transportation to facilities to communications are obtained by the logistics section. We also have liaisons from our tribes because they have resources and needs during a disaster. And something may be unique to our region, but we hope that all regions do. We have a desk for VOAD, Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster, and they are responsible for the uh, not only volunteer management, but donation management. We also have a group with them. We happen to call them Prepare Washoe. They're a public-private partnership. So in other words, we try to work closely with the private sector because the private sector has resources that local government does not have. And we want to ensure that we're communicating with our businesses in the region so they understand the scope of the emergency, the response, and the recovery again, so we can work in partnership with the private sector. The brains of the outfit, if you will, is the management section. Now, in the incident command system, it is uh, the incident command system, as the name implies, has a commander, an IC, an incident commander. We do not command anything at an emergency operations center. The incident commander is somebody that's out in the field solving the incident. So we manage resources and uh, overarching objectives 
across the entire region. So we don't call this the command section, we call this the management section. And it has all the usual suspects, a director that's directing operations of the emergency operations center, the emergency manager to advise, assist, and also safety to ensure that we're taking care of our responders and the general public, legal to ensure that we're doing things within the boundaries of the law, a public information officer representative, and a liaison, which is typically, in our case, someone from the state. The other piece of the Emergency Operations Center is behind the glass, and that's our policy room. So our elected officials set policy for emergency operations. They are not physically in the coordination room. They are, uh, they are shall we say, at another plane. They're making policy, and they're giving guidance to the emergency operation. They meet in the policy room, and the plans are briefed to our elected officials, and they, uh, they approve all the actions that occur within the jurisdiction in accordance with law. Now, I'll mention one other thing. Every emergency operations center is designed to address hazards. And in our case, we have 13 main identified hazards for our region. The main hazards are earthquake, flooding, and wildland fire. But all 13 can affect our region in some shape or another. Essential to all emergency operations is communications with the public. And to that end, this is also an alert and warning center. We use the emergency alert system that will send messages over television, radio, and even now from cell towers through wireless emergency alerts to cell phones. But when all else fails, we have our amateur radio operators that will ensure that the message gets out to the public and in and out of our region. And uh, the group that we use is known as the Amateur Emergency Radio Service, ARIES. And uh, most recently, in a winter storm, they set up a relay between this center and the far north of Washoe County when the tele uh, telephone system went down and we couldn't do 911 calls. They relayed those messages over the uh, HF radio. So a valuable part of our operation. Let's look in the radio room and learn more. Hi, I'm Bob Miller, Emergency Coordinator for Washoe County for Amateur Radio Emergency Service, also known as ARIES. In here we provide backup communications for the Emergency Operations Center. We have a pretty robust communication system for our public service people, but many times uh, our emergency manager wants information and doesn't want to tie up our emergency frequencies, so we're here to help support. We have a variety of modes of communications in here. We have uh, voice communications, both via uh, local communications and worldwide, radio to radio anywhere in the world. We have three means of sending email outside of the area by amateur radio. We can communicate almost anywhere in the world and then drop an email into the internet by remote locations. Uh, so this gives you an idea of some of the equipment we have. So we have two identical radios voice radio and data radio. Essentially, ham radio operators were sending emails before anyone had access to the internet. It's called packet communications. So the computer on the far end is tied to that radio there, which is identical to this one, so if something happens, it goes back and forth. All right. Uh, we've got two laptops, one hooked to that radio, one hooked to this radio. This is the radio that goes anywhere in the world, radio to radio. So I can send an email outside of this area or outside of the U.S. and it gets dropped back into the internet. That radio over there is local. We do the same thing. We can send an email outside of the area if there's no local internet connection and drop an email back in that way. Uh, this is an inter internet based uh, communication system. 
I can talk anywhere in the world uh, as long as the internet's working to that particular country. And over here, along this wall, uh, about 60 hospitals in the state of Nevada have that same equipment for backup communications uh, after, during an emergency.